All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, my name is Will Thompson from the Austin Lawyers Chapter. If everyone could get ready for our second panel of the day. Uh, we will be discussing big tech regulation and innovation. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this panel. Uh, many of you know him. He has held uh, lawyer positions in the highest levels of state and federal government, uh, in private practice, and now in the federal judiciary. Uh, Judge Cam Barker is well known to many people in this room as uh, one of the humblest and uh, fairest judges we have in Texas. So please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here with this panel of four distinguished commentators. Let me introduce them briefly, and then I'll open with some questions to each, to the panel, and then we'll entertain some audience questions as well. First on my immediate left, David Asselman has just been hired as the general counsel for the Florida House of Representatives. For the last two years, he was the general counsel for the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation. There, he managed the legal operations of Florida's primary business regulatory agency, whose jurisdiction covers the alcoholic beverage, tobacco, hotel, restaurant, and other industries, as well as more than two dozen licensed professions. To his left is Richard Delefay. Richard is the vice president at Trust Ventures, where he helps venture funds deal with uh, and review the operations of early stage companies involved in areas of complex regulatory risk, ranging from the energy sector to elder care services. Prior to his time at Trust Ventures, Richard was a venture associate with the Innovation Fund at the University of Chicago and Tusk Strategies. To his left is Chris Greco. Chris is general counsel at Fay Labs, a crypto startup working on decentralized finance. He previously held multiple high-level positions in the federal government, including in the White House Counsel Office, as a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia, and as a counsel in the House Judiciary Committee. Most recently, he served as an Associate Deputy Attorney General at the Department of Justice, where he helped lead the department's technology review. And to his left is Scott Keller. Scott's the co-founder of the national litigation boutique Lahotsky Keller. He's argued 12 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court and many other appeals and courts throughout the nation. Before founding his firm, Scott chaired Baker Bott's Supreme Court practice, served as the Solicitor General of Texas, and was Senator Ted Cruz's chief counsel in the Senate Judiciary Committee. The topic of today's panel is regulation versus innovation, tech disruption, and the state's response. Richard, let me start with a question to you. From your experience at Trust Ventures, can you walk us through some examples of what sort of regulatory hurdles and risk are facing some of the early stage companies that you advise? Yeah, absolutely. So I probably come at this a little differently than other folks on the panel since I'm really coming at it first from an investor lens. And then we go and offer our regulatory strategy services to the early stage companies we're, we're investing in. So, you know, we're talking about two founders and a couple of computers oftentimes when we're talking to them. They don't understand what regulatory work really means, right? And so the very first thing we're doing in most of these cases is educating the founders and then trying to build with them some sense of what early stage communications with the regulatory authority should really look like, right? So, you know, as a good example, we invested about a year and a half ago into a company that is trying to produce a novel means of eradicating mosquitoes. And the way they do that is by irradiating male mosquitoes and then releasing those irradiated males into the general population. The benefit being that mosquitoes only mate once, you kill all the mosquitoes in your area, and you're done. Uh, the question is, does that count as a pesticide? So, you know, the interesting thing for them is I don't think the founders ever considered that question until they tried to go sell their product. And, you know, some distributor said, well, do I need to have, you know, specific folks go out there and because I'm worried about, you know, X, Y, and Z rule in Georgia for pesticides. And, you know, the founder kind of paused and didn't know what to respond to that because I don't think it had ever occurred to him that that was something he was going to have to deal with. And so we walked in, we started building a strategy with them. And within a couple of months, we had responses from the regulatory authorities in California and Georgia and a few other states that clarified the question. And then they were greenlit. So, you know, those are the kinds of basic things that we do on the front end. The harder things is when the regulator is potentially going to give you a response you don't want. And that's really where we start coming in and offering the more creative solution building, right? Um, that is hard if you've already had a conversation with a regulator. So that is why we do the work that we do so early in the company's existence. Because if you are going and having a conversation with, say, the FDA, 
and you want to claim that you don't fit one of the medical ca device categories that they lay out up front, well, you better not respond and say, yes, I agree with you, right? That's a bad thing to get started. But early stage companies, they just aren't thinking in that lens. And so a lot of what we're doing is helping them set out those goalposts so we can see the probability of winning on each of these different opportunity sets and then deciding where do we go put those resources. Um, you know, generally speaking, I think a lot of people also go and forward and ask us like, well, would you change regulations? We've done that in certain cases. Um, we've worked on things like televeterinary medicine regulations in, you know, Florida, for instance, and, you know, we'll do those things where it makes sense and where we can tailor our ask. But the very first thing we're doing is sitting down with our founders and trying to figure out, is that a good spend of time, resources, and does it really matter to you? at the end of the day to lose the state or to not. Um, and you know what we typically like to do is go and start a front end strategy of coalition building. Can we get Walmart on board? Can we work with the veterinarian association to potentially get to a solution that's more accommodating for both parties? And then we'll move forward from there. Um, but you know, I would say it's pretty broad ranging. I, I don't think there's like one particular ask that can fit every single company, but I will say, one thing that I have discovered from the regulatory perspective that's always important to think about, especially with innov innovating companies, is they are probably not thinking about all their unknowns, right? And so it's really our job, and it's the job of every attorney that's sitting next to them, and really trying to help fill in those gaps, even if you're just flagging them, right? It's it very much is issue, you know, it, you know, issue spotting from law school, except to like yeah, quite an important degree, right? Because this is potentially the difference between the start of failing or, or winning. If a company doesn't have a strong regulatory strategy from day one, they can probably get like $2 million to get their initial company off the ground. But I bet you they're not going to raise their next 10, right? And so the question is like, how do you push them forward in a way that gives them the opportunity to do that? So that's generally speaking, the kind of the range of things that we see. Yeah. Richard, you, you just mentioned the companies you're advising interacting with state regulators. So let me turn to David. David, you just wrapped up your two years working in Florida's primary regulatory agency. Can you describe what consideration did your agency give the impact on small businesses, disruptive tech businesses, when it was considering a new regulation or modifying a regulation? Sure. Well, uh, in Florida, we try to do whatever we can not to impose unnecessarily burdensome regulations or unnecessary barriers to entry into certain professions or industries. Um, and that's reflected not just in our mission statement as an agency and not just in order to make sure we're staying aligned with the governor's priorities, but that's even reflected in our Administrative Procedure Act. So, for example, any time a Florida agency is going to create a rule, it has to consider whether that rule is going to have an adverse impact on small businesses and also whether that rule is expected to increase regulatory costs by a certain dollar amount over a certain number of years. And if the answer is yes, then we have to complete what's called a statement of estimated regulatory costs, which includes an economic analysis, and you've got to consider lower cost regulatory alternatives. Um, and there are consequences if you don't do that, because our APA says that the failure to do that is a material uh, violation of the rulemaking process and your failure to prepare that economic analysis can actually potentially be used against you in a rule challenge down the road. Uh, so we take that stuff seriously. Does What is Florida's general approach to empowering agencies to have flexibility to adapt to new business models by disruptive tech companies? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I, I think this may be more of a red state issue, but there's a little bit of a tension where two things are true at the same time. On the one hand, we want to be a pro-business, pro-innovation state, and we are, um, you know, I'm just speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the Florida government, of course, but you've probably seen in the news, um, many of our elected officials are openly recruiting businesses to relocate from California, New York, Chicago, and elsewhere. Uh, so the last thing we want to do is, you know, hit them over the head with, uh, unnecessarily burdensome regulations. Um, so we want to be pro-business and pro-innovation, and that means we want our agencies to be able to say yes when a new business model or a new technology is proposed. But at the same time, uh, as a conservative state, we don't want an administrative state that runs amok and that has too much power. So we actually confine our agency's rulemaking authority uh, in pretty significant ways which sometimes, you know, the idea is we don't want an agency to get in the way by saying no, but there may be unintended consequences where that also makes it harder for the agency to say yes because you're not giving them the rulemaking authority that might be necessary to approve a certain regulatory model. 
So at least in Florida, there's maybe a little greater than average incentive for companies with disruptive business models to seek legislative change as opposed to regulatory change? Yeah, I mean, our, our rulemaking uh, requirements in Florida are pretty restrictive on agencies. So the way it works in Florida, at least and in some other states, um, a general grant of rulemaking authority is not enough for an agency to actually make a valid rule. Um, you need to be implementing a specific power or duty of the agency that this enabling legislation gives you. So, you know, one well-known example in Florida is from about 20 years ago where an appellate court held that my agency didn't have authority to define poker. Up until July of this year, we were the state regulator for paramutual wagering, so you know, horse racing, card rooms, slot machines, casino operations, to simplify it. So you might think, okay, the state regulator of card rooms certainly can define what poker is, but no, we were not allowed to define what poker is because we weren't implementing a specific power or duty. Um, and, I, and we'll talk about this more in a bit, but this has serious implications when an agency is confronted with a new technology or maybe an old technology that's being used in a new way. Um, and sometimes that sends you scrambling. I mean, the first thing you gotta think about is, do we even have jurisdiction as an agency? What is this technology? I, I think the crypto example is a good example, and I, I won't uh, step out of my lane by talking too much about it, but when it first came out, it's, you know, is it money? Is it, is it a security? Is it a commodity? I think we're still having those conversations to some extent. So something that's totally disruptive, the agency might not even know, you know, do we have any kind of jurisdiction over it? And then assuming that the agency does have jurisdiction, if you're in a state like Florida, the next question is, well, do we have rulemaking authority? Um, and even if you have rulemaking authority, now you get to a whole a different series of challenging questions, which is how do we make a rule? If this is a novel technology, uh, we need to make sure we understand it before we can even draft a coherent rule at all, right? Um, there may be unintended consequences for other areas of the law. I'll give you a concrete example of a new technology we've been seeing within the past year or so, which is vending machines that can create and bake a pizza. I mean, that's not what you would think of as a vending machine. And under our statute, um, a public food service establishment can include certain kinds of vending machines if they dispense potentially hazardous foods, which means basically temperature controlled foods. So what do we do when we're confronted with this new kind of vending machine, right? It, it has some aspects of a restaurant. It seems to fit within a public food service establishment definition. But if we, if we say, okay, that means we've got rulemaking authority and we can regulate this, well, what are the consequences for the rest of the, you know, the restaurant statutes, which impose certain sanitation requirements, for example, like having a sink where employees can wash their hands, that obviously doesn't apply in the context of a vending machine, and there are other things that don't apply either. So how do we go about regulating that new form of technology that doesn't really fit into the existing statutes? And this is not just limited to new technology either, by the way. I mean, sometimes there's an old technology that's being used in a well-established way, but the statute's even older. Um, and to give you a concrete example of that, um, we see that in the liquor space with online sales. I mean, e-commerce has been around since the 90s. That's, there's nothing new about selling products through a website. Um, and our liquor statute, our liquor store statute, says that a liquor store has to be open and operating for a certain number of days and hours a year in order to maximize tax revenues to the state. Okay, well, if you're selling your liquor through a website, are you open and operating? And here is really the problem. The problem is the statute says that the licensed premises is what has to be open and operating. So even though there's this lengthy exposition of legislative intent within the statute itself that says the intent is that you are open all the time so you can sell more liquor and increase tax revenues to the state, um, and arguably if you've got a 24-7 website, you can sell more liquor and raise more money for the state, and yet, in my opinion anyway, that doesn't comply with the statute, and this is something that comes up frequently because if you actually look at the text of the statute, which you always have to do, remembering that we as a regulatory agency are administering a statute and we don't have authority to go beyond the statute. So if the statute says the licensed premises has to be open a certain number of hours and days, then from my perspective, our hands are tied. And yeah, it may be a better solution to sell things on the internet, but unless and until the legislature updates the statute, uh, you know, we can't grant regulatory approval for that sort of thing. Yeah. Let me pick up on 
A couple of topics you mentioned. Thank you, David. Uh, you mentioned crypto and jurisdictional disputes between regulatory agencies. So let me turn to you, Chris. You work at a cryptocurrency company now. Could you set the stage for us on the current state of play at a federal regulatory level on cryptocurrency? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of hinted at it. There's there's a lot of jurisdictional um, issues going on in crypto, whether it's a commodity, whether it's a security, who are the regulatory bodies that are involved. Um, you know, the SEC, CFTC certainly um, are trying to make it their jurisdiction. In fact, both of them had enforcement actions this week that are somewhat uh, oppositional to each other and would be impossible for a crypto company to abide by both of them. Um, and at the same time, there's also a lot of stuff going on in, in the state sphere. Um, there's a lot of states that are being proactive and kind of recruiting crypto companies and, you know, ostensibly trying to set up uh, you know the equivalent of like Delaware corporate re- corporate law for for crypto companies uh, in an, in a way to entice them to come, um, but the problem is there's still kind of this over overarching question of you know what is the federal jurisdiction on this and, and where does it fit into the federal regulatory scheme and so you know for a lot of these companies any of the state kind of proactive uh, approaches really don't make sense because it's you know picking your head up and and potentially exposing yourself to to regulation from the federal government or enforcement yeah. from the federal government. So it's, it's a complicated mix right now. And you mentioned the SEC and the CFTC. Are there any other federal agencies in the mix? And what sort of policy concerns are driving the regulations between the different agencies? Yeah, I mean, so the CFTC, CFTC and SEC are certainly the biggest two, but um, Treasury, um, any of the kind of federal banking um, entities are involved. OFAC, FinCEN, um, it, it, it depends a little bit on what the, the actual crypto entity is and, and what, the, what the product is. But, um, you know, I think there's everything from consumer protection issues, um, information, if it's a security or not. Um, on the national security front, you've, you've seen recent enforcement actions by um, OFAC against some of the um, some some crypto that was being used to basically uh, money launder on behalf of the North Koreans. So there's mm-hmm. there's a whole multitude of issues, um, but there are a number of and and I you know most of the entities in this space are actually trying to be um, you know good citizens on this. I think, but it's really hard because there's so little clarity on on what to do. Yeah, and sometimes you see. You know, companies with the disruptive business model try to avoid regulation, sort of the early days of the Uber business yeah. model. And then other times you see companies lean into it yeah. and try to have a dialogue at the up, at the very upfront stages of their business. Uh, I guess the question for Chris or Richard, but what are the pros and cons of those approaches and how do you advise your clients to confront that balance? I mean, in, in the crypto space, it has definitely been for the last few years kind of uh, assume that nothing applies and avoid it. And, and, and um, the few companies that have tried to register have actually or, 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 you know, whether it's register with the state entities or even trying to register with the SEC or something have gotten basically shot down. And so um, I think that's rapidly coming to an end because there's, you know, increasing enforcement actions in all these spaces. But there's also the the risk right now has become so great and in a down economy, especially with crypto being down, like I don't think the investments are actually going to continue at the pace they were with this uncertainty because you can't build that into how you're looking at these if if you, you, you can't be taking that risk um, in a down economy, basically. Yeah. Richard, how about you? Yeah. So. To add to that slightly, you know, I think we've seen, certainly in a down economy, that has really changed the game for crypto companies in terms of what they have to show. That's true across the board for any tech company, uh, particularly if you have high regulatory risk. However, what I'm also hearing is a lot of, well, I don't need to run this business in the United States anymore. I'm going to Hong Kong. And I don't think that was true in the first two waves of you know, crypto innovation because the uh, level of developer and infrastructure you know, in the United States to push this technology as the premier technology of you know, American innovators was pretty strong. And so there was no need to leave. Um, as enforcement expands, uh, that's not necessarily going to be true. The cost is getting too high. And so you know, I do think there, you know, we've often talked about this risk of can the United States maintain a forefront in crypto and 
continue in the ambiguous zone that it has historically been in? And I think the answer is pretty emphatically no. You know, we're seeing folks just pack up and move somewhere else. Um, some of the largest crypto funds in the world and some of, many of the most interesting things happening in the space of like DeFi are gonna happen in East Asia and it's gonna happen in the Caribbean and anywhere that's not here. Um, and we're gonna see the impact of that on the crypto space eventually. Um, I still think the United States has a chance to reverse course on that, but it is quite interesting because from our standpoint, uh, I think as investors, we're actually getting more comfortable with that. Is the answer now just go do this somewhere else and we'll let the United States kind of fight out to some level of stability and understand what we're at least up against before we go forward with a, a pretty pro-US strategy and then end up in a world like Coinbase, but I'm not gonna have any of the funding of Coinbase to go you know, have a conversation that lasts three years with a, with a crypto regulator. That's a really tough thing to ask from an investor standpoint. Right, so well, Scott, let me turn to you. We've been talking so far about the strategies of, of both regulators and of attorneys who are advising companies with um, disruptive business models to confront regulatory obstacles through negotiating with regulators, through figuring out jurisdictional issues. Another strategy for addressing regulatory hurdles is, of course, litigation, area with which you're all familiar. Uh, I looked at your firm's website, and the first bullet point on the What We Do page is, we litigate challenges to federal, state, and local laws and regulations. So can you share some examples with us of some of the regulatory issues that you've addressed through litigation? Yeah, absolutely. It's great to be back uh, with you among so many mentors and friends. Uh, we have been very fortunate in starting our firm just a year and a half in to uh, be able to work with some amazing lawyers and uh, have clients in cases that uh, are in the headlines and are giving us the opportunity to to bring all those various challenges. So we, you, know, you talk about the federal level, you talk about the state level, you talk about municipality levels. We. Uh, represented 26 business associations challenging the Biden administration's OSHA vaccine mandate. We're currently representing Tesla challenging Louisiana law that prohibits Tesla from selling cars directly to consumers. We are currently representing Petland up uh, suing the city of Dallas over an ordinance about when you can sell dogs. So that, that's all to say that you know it's in our DNA uh, that government regulation that our clients and businesses face that when there are legal issues that can be brought to bear, that's when we step in. Of course, you know, for our clients' sake, you, you ne a business never wants to have to get to litigation. So by the time that it, it does, um, usually some of the tactics that, that you all have been talking about have, have clearly taken place um, and have failed. Um, you know, I was also, you know, something David said earlier about you have kind of certain legal texts or approaches to the law, whether it's in a statute or a rule, and they're ingrained, and then you fast forward however many years and technology evolves. You know, I, I saw that case in point uh, in a DC Circuit argument a couple years ago. Uh, we were litigating um, on behalf of GM and Ford and Mitsubishi, car manufacturers, technology manufacturers, and we were dealing with the illustrious, I'm sure you've heard of this, the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992. <laughs> Now, remember in 1992, we all had cassette tapes, a little more of an analog era, and then you fast forward, how does that statute apply decades later when you obviously have MP3s and streaming music, and, and how does that fit in? And so I think sometimes what happens is you have legislator, legislatures, legislators, uh, agency officials, and they're drafting laws and rules for a, at a certain point in time. And that snapshot, the world doesn't necessarily translate that way when you fast forward. Um, a case you may have heard about, uh, Net Choice versus Paxton. Uh, we represent two trade associations that are challenging Texas social media law. I'm not going to get into it too much because litigation is still pending. But what I can tell you is one of the aspects of that case involves Section 230, uh, liability shield. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of that. All internet websites. Uh, the statute says, uh, shall not be treated as publishers, and that has then consequences for liability. Now, that statute was enacted a generation ago, and I think we have the internet uh, that we have today, clearly because of that approach that Congress took years ago. Uh, but of course, you know, at the advent of the internet, 
the policy decisions that our people's representatives were making at that time, that, that was a judgment that was made then, and it obviously has big consequences going forward. Uh, so, you know, I guess for me, when you talk about technology and talk about the law, I think one of the most important facets of it is just to understand the dynamic that technology, it, we're, we're so lucky to live in a society where technology in America is so innovative that the products that we're all using are, you know, they, they are tremendous, uh, in, in helping us through our daily lives and everything. And, but they also can shape society, and, and we need to be mindful of that. And I think it's also hard, though, for lawmakers to be able to predict exactly how technology is going to be playing out and how their rules and laws are going to play out over the years. Right. Yeah. Chris, I want to turn to you because Scott mentioned uh, a section of federal law that has sort of very specific terms. You mentioned the Securities Act and the SEC which the courts have adopted a sort of broad ranging multi-factor test for what's a security. Can you share with us your experience on that and the state of the law of the definition of security? Yeah, like I mean, the, the, the definition is, uh, uh, you know, the Howey test, and that goes back to orange groves in Florida in the 1950s uh, that, that, that this, the court ruled is a, uh, an investment contract. But it's also, you know, the last couple of years with, with crypto, um, the SEC has taken an approach basically that they think everything is a security. Um, at the same time, recently, um, one of the enforcement chairmen of the chair, chair of the SEC said, like, there are certain things that are, if they are decentralized enough, um, they won't be considered a security. And so when you think of crypto and the blockchain, um, as we were, we were saying earlier, like, it is international. And so the people that are participating on the blockchain are throughout the entire world. Most of them um, are decentralized. And so uh, the SEC, at least in advisory um, announcements, has said if you are sufficiently decentralized, you are not a security. Um, so it's this, this weird dichotomy between everything is a security, but also if you're sufficiently decentralized, you're not a security. Well, so if you think about that from something that's, that's starting up from the, from the ground, it is really hard to go from, uh, you know, an innovative product that is just starting to being completely decentralized. Um, and so all of these um, tokens usually go through some kind of growth stage where there's uh, a group of people starting it and then it spreads and decentralizes. And so you're, you're caught in this catch 22 of your, your potentially a security at the beginning, but if you get big enough and you get decentralized enough, the SEC is going to say you're not a security. So um, it's a really hard way to navigate and doesn't allow you to grow, really, if you're from the get-go a security but could get to something that you're not a security. So uh, one of the things we've, we've, we've talked about um, in, in this space is that you know maybe there should be a safe harbor of some kind, like a few years for you to not have to do the, the um, strict registration with the SEC. If you grow big enough, you get decentralized enough. If you get global enough, then you would be deemed not a security. And if in that time frame of the safe harbor, you don't meet those criteria, then you would have to go in and register as a security. Right. And I, that safe harbor idea, I understand uh, a number of legislatures in different states across the country are experimenting with enacting that at a well, legislative level, not just as a regulatory agency matter, something called a regulatory sandbox. The idea being sort of like a kid sandbox allows the kids' room to be messy within a confined environment, the legislature passes a program to lift certain regulations on disruptive tech companies within limits. Do any of the panelists have experience with uh, companies you advise or have regulated taking advantage of regulatory sandboxes and how have that worked out? Yeah, I, I have a couple of examples. So, you know, sandboxes are pretty new, right? So it's, it's not like we've seen, you know, dozens and dozens of companies go through them yet that have really like impacted at a broad scale. But we have started seeing early stage companies who may have done business in California and or you know New York, states that historically have been a little more difficult on some nuance of the regulatory scheme. And they say, I'm out, this doesn't work for my unit economics and I'm gonna go try in a state like Arizona because it is now 
more acceptable potentially to run their model and they could potentially gain some significant benefits out of the sandbox. So a good example would be uh, education reform. You know, it's, it's hard to try to build a micro school or a micro uh, daycare center in California, even if your local regulator loves it. So, you know, we invested in this company called Tiny Care and they effectively attach the micro daycare license to the teachers based on how California law is written. And that allows them up to a certain number of students to run these micro schools or micro daycare centers within uh, close, closer proximity to parents in commercial facilities and residential buildings, wherever. Um, it worked great and people in, in San Francisco loved it, including the regulator, but it just turns out that because the license attaches to the teacher, uh, you know, what if your teacher leaves? You know, what do you do in that situation? Well, the answer is you got to find a new teacher with a new license and you have to go right through the process again. And there was no way to cohere those two systems. How do you get the teacher fast-tracked, right? If you need somebody to come in on an expedited basis, how do you get an assistant teacher to have basically a license ready to go? And those were the complicating factors. California's, you know, regulatory agencies were not ready to, to work with them. So, you know, in that sense, a state like Arizona might take that as an opportunity and say, hey, we already have a system that allows for these micro day daycare centers to run fairly effectively. Can we augment this into a sustainable model? I think that makes sense. There are, however, you know, the devil's in the implementation and we'll see how that goes, right? Because, you know, if you're an early stage company and you think you have regulatory risk and you're now telling them, well, I want you to go and you know, open the kimono to the state agency and then see how you do. Obviously, you can imagine a founder saying, are you crazy? Like, why would I do that? And so, because you're effectively not opening the kimono to just them, you're doing it to every locality that might be paying attention, right? So that could be another state. Certainly, they're going to have other states that are on their roadmap, or even other counties or cities who still might be able to enforce against them, right? So we have a company in our portfolio called Swimply. Swimply is Airbnb for pools, very easy to understand. And guess what? Like, you know, the cities are the biggest problems. It's really not the states. And so even if you're working on things like what is counted as a public pool, that's not necessarily going to save them from zoning restrictions, right? And so, you know, they have difficult mixes of, of interests, right? And in that sense, it's not obvious yet how those sandboxes are gonna go work with other localities that, that might have impact and say, hey, we want to expand the pie. We wanna be able to give these companies two years to run in a way that actually meaningfully impacts this company. And you know, that probably means engagement among multiple parties. Um, so you know, we're very optimistic. I think what Arizona has done and Utah has done have been great. Um, we wanna see more of that. I think generalized sandboxes are definitely the way to go. If I don't really believe in the whole like focus on one specific concept like fintech because who knows what the next wave of innovation is going to look like um, and you know if you pursue that in a way that's implemented as if you are taking the founder's approach right which is i have to grow this company in an x period of time or this idea will likely not succeed long term i think there's a lot of general good that could be produced out of it but you know the jury's out we'll see right so same boxes have been justified as not only promoting consumer welfare by allowing new business models, but also promoting the local economies in the states that adopt them by attracting tech companies to do business there. Have you seen that bear out on the ground? It sounds like you have in a uh, couple of cases. Yeah, so in, in the cases where the startups are running you know, or empowering, you know, some form of small business at the local level, obviously you can talk about that impact, right? So I think an example like Tiny Care is, is obvious because you're seeing parents benefit, you're seeing teachers that are on the ground there benefit. There's lots of different stakeholders there. But tech is weird, right? And especially right now where we've seen this decentralization of the labor force purely because you're doing a better, you know, scheme of regulatory action doesn't mean that this company is going to move a substantial percentage of their operations to this new place, right? That is a long-term game. And so I think one thing that many of these states that are building sandboxes have to think is, it's, I'm really building a 20-year strategy to be a tech hub, right? I mean, Austin and the state of Texas have done this very well, right? It's not like they went from Dell to this in a matter of, you know, a year, right? It was a 30-year process, right? Um, Utah is doing a tremendously good job of this because if you talk about what is happening in Salt Lake City, it isn't just regulatory. Regulatory is just one prong of the multi-tech development hub that they're building, which is talent related. They have some of the best developers in the business now. It's about finance and it's about showing that there are great startups that have been able to produce meaningful results locally. Um, and so I do think like it's important to kind of not expect immediate results out of a sandbox. That's not the point. You have to give them enough breathing room in order to 
really fit within the broader scheme of what you know a state or a city wants to see from an innovation perspective. Yeah, uh, another concern that some commentators have raised with regulations that are outdated for modern technology is not so much the fact that they're well-intentioned but outdated, but some commentators express concern about the issue of regulatory capture, that the re regulatory bodies themselves are self-interested. Uh, this uh, question to the panel, whether Scott in dealing with, with litigation on the issue or David in dealing with a regulator, regulator's approach to the issue, what sort of legal challenges or policy safeguards are available to address the concern about regulatory capture? Scott, you want yeah, to Yeah, so uh, you know, I, I guess I've seen both sides of what I'm about to talk about, which is if you have active market participants serving on a state commission or a state board that then regulates the industry. Uh, in our Tesla case, uh, we've pleaded in that complaint this exact issue, and it goes to a 2013 Supreme Court case called North Carolina Dental Board, where the Supreme Court held that while if you have state action, that doesn't violate federal antitrust laws. However, if you have a board with active market participants, then the state has to have sufficient active supervision over that board. In other words, you need state officials, you need government officials, not just the private active market participants, or antitrust laws will apply. And so, you know, we saw this in a case called Teladoc uh, when uh, Judge Barker and I were in the Texas Solicitor General's office. Obviously, this is playing out now um, and will play out in our test litigation. Uh, but you know, that is one issue that, you know, you call it regulatory capture or call it just how commissions are structured. And I know, I'm sure in Florida, I know in Texas and other states, after the Supreme Court decision came out in the North Carolina uh, case in 2013, you know, there, there were various questions over, okay, well, what is active supervision? How much supervision? What does that look like? Um, and so how that issue continues uh, to play out, I think, whether it's the businesses being regulated could potentially have legal avenues to pursue, or how states and, and executive branches want to structure their own the regulators. They're, you know, there are very different approaches as to how you can you know, create agencies to wield executive power. Um, and I think some states have taken a look at some of these commissions and thought, well, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, let's structure our government differently. Yeah. David, can you tell us a little bit about Florida's approach to this issue? Does it have a sunset commission for regulatory agencies? And is there any sort of uh, periodic review to address the concern about potential regulatory capture? Uh, sunset review is an interesting uh, ongoing issue in Florida. Um, we, we're, We've been asked to try to sunset some of our rules and it's not really clear whether we can do that or not. Hmm. Um, it's kind of a, a bit of an open question and I'm actually on my way out of the executive branch and into the legislative branch, so I suppose I won't say too much about that. Um, but we, you know, we try to find other ways. There was some, a proposed legislation to require agencies to review their rules uh, periodically and have the rules expire automatically um, unless they are affirmatively readopted. So, you know, we're always looking for ways to ensure that we don't have old regulations on the book or things that are impeding progress because it was written 10 years ago and it really has no application anymore. Right. And Chris, we've been mostly talking about challenges to state regulation under federal antitrust law on this sort of concerted action theory. But is there any analog to that at the federal level where it sounds like more of the regulation, potential regulation of crypto exists. Um, say that again? Is there any sort of a challenge available from a legal perspective to federal regulatory action based on concerted action of market participants? Um, well, I, there's definitely litigation going on in the crypto space challenging the SEC's jurisdiction, stuff like that. Um, and I think there's certainly gonna be more. Um, you know, the, the SEC has, taken a pretty aggressive approach on, on some insider trading um, charges recently. Uh, I know some of so, some of the folks are challenging that. Um, the, the, actually, yeah, the, the regulatory capture thing, actually, I, I wish there was a little bit more regulatory capture in, 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 in uh, the federal government. It's interesting because, uh, at least as, as it relates to crypto, uh, <laughs> there is actually no 
no one in the federal government is, is allowed to own crypto and work on it. You are recused from it because it is considered an investment. And so it would be mm -hmm. the equivalent of you working on a Google case if you own Google stock. And so, um, you know, in the Biden administration, they had one person that was supposedly their tech leader um, who was doing all of the antitrust stuff, but also supposedly, you know, had an expertise in crypto. Well, the ethics rules prohibited him from actually working on that. So he either had to sell his crypto or... Um, you know, um, disavow himself from, from working on that case. And so, you know, it's one of those things that's like a, a small rule that supposedly applies to every kind of, um, you know, investment, um, but is preventing some real expertise in the area in, in the regulatory space. Yeah, thanks. Well, the last issue I wanted to address before we open it up for questions from the audience is um, if your particulars, your examples of dealing with the pros and cons of state level versus federal level regulation, you know, allowing laboratories of experimentation to flourish versus having some nationwide uniformity that allows efficiencies at the national scale. Um, so maybe Richard, start with you and with the companies you advise, how do you advise them on that trade off and what sort of um, balance do they perceive in, in that regard? Yeah, I mean, the problem with the federal government is it's a much more binary outcome. I only have one chance to throw the dice. And so it's possible that it could be a great opportunity for you to receive a blanket and universal approval, but could take a really long time, could be very messy, and you could get a no, right? And so I think this is, for instance, the number one thing that has impeded modular nuclear reactors from coming to market. This technology has been available since the 70s and the 80s. It is very safe. It was research that was promoted and done purely with federal dollars, right? So this, this is something that we should understand very well. The NRC, until very recently, was just not equipped to handle those types of reviews. And their perception of what is a efficient and novel review scheme that's gonna transform the system could still take five, six years. You know, that, that's just the nature of what it, what it is. Um, and so, you know, you have this issue where it's very much just the present value of the risk of one single approval, right? That's all I care about when I'm thinking about the company. And you can see how difficult that is for the founder to look at and say, well, I have this wonderful idea, I wanna go pursue it. I'm like, that's great, but you're gonna need $50 million to get through approval and it's gonna be very expensive. And so, you know, those are things where you look at those types of federal regulatory challenges and it doesn't look as attractive as some of these state issues, right? If you can work through the state regulatory scheme, particularly because, you know, you've got a lot of different states that could be really comfortable business areas of operation. Could be Texas, could be Florida, could be, you know, wherever. Um, why wouldn't you want to do that, right? There's just certain things that that's not possible, um, but it is still the case that I think you are much more likely to create a huge headache for yourself at the federal level versus at the state level, you can still go in and have informal conversations with regional offices, with regulators, just understand what they're thinking. They are typically a little more open to having those conversations up front um, and trying to find a way to make it work, particularly if you can, you know, forum shop, if you want to call it that, right, and start having conversations with areas that you think are more promotive. Great example is insurance, right? Insurance is actually a, a wonderful scheme of 50 state regulators, and you have states that are all over the map. There are states who effectively run their entire state regulatory authority seems much more viable um, in most cases versus a federal issue. Right. So you like federal regulation when it's good for you? <laughs> In other well, places, like I don't think regulation. it's necessarily good in those cases. I think it, it goes back to you know, Scott's point, what was written in the books 20 years ago? So for instance, mm -hmm. the FDA has all these regulations about how you can um, conduct veterinary services for farm animals that they wrote out thinking this is only gonna apply to farmers from now on. Turns out there's a huge impact to that on veterinary practice generally, mm -hmm. and no one's bothered to read those regs because why would they? The only people that was gonna benefit were people who were doing televeterinary tele -veterinary medicine across state borders, and that wasn't something that, that was gonna matter mm -hmm. until right now, right? And so that's just saying these are the tools in the arsenal. There's regulatory capture at the state level already, right? And so we're just trying to even the playing field, and it opens up the bid for negotiation, right? Interesting. Do any of the other panelists have any color that you can add from your experiences with state versus federal regulation? And Scott, you mentioned a little bit Section 230 is a federal law versus state laws. Anything else you want to reflect on in that regard? Well, I, mean, I think it's going to just be context specific and business and industry specific. I mean, I do know that there are some times that industries really truly want a clear answer and uniformity. 
Uh, and so, you know, I'd imagine there are some situations where, yeah, we all want laboratories of democracy and we want experimentation. And then there are going to be other industries where they just want a clear answer and they want a uniform and so that then they can structure the businesses that way. Uh, but yeah, wh whether you're talking about the federal state level government, there's also a difference between, you know, dealing with the legislature versus dealing with administrative agencies. Uh, and I think, you know, all of those axes come to play when you're advising a business, particularly a technology company, you know, okay, how do you solve this perceived problem? And is it federal, is it state, is it, uh, you know, is it litigation or is it negotiation? Yeah. Well, I'll follow up on something Richard said uh, when he was talking about seeking informal guidance. That's something that at least at the state level uh, can pose challenges for us because, you know, we need to figure out where do we draw the line between giving informal guidance and running the risk of having an unpromulgated rule or some states call it an unadopted rule or an unwritten rule. And the, the concept is that if as, as a regulatory body you have a, you're relying on a statement of general applicability about what the statute means or how you implement it, uh, you can get in big trouble. In Florida, for example, if we, uh, if we rely on an unpromulgated rule, in other words, if we are making decisions that affect people's substantial interests based on a general policy that we haven't adopted as a rule, not only can the regulated person uh, bring a rule challenge, bring a, an administrative challenge to make us stop relying on it, but we're exposed to uncapped attorney's fees. And so in practice, what we often see is, you know, a represented party doesn't like a decision we've made or is trying to force our hand into making a decision when we need more time to figure out what exactly they're doing. And, you know, they'll have their lawyer send a letter and subtly suggest that, you know, if we're approving this type of business model, but we're reluctant to approve this other type, we must be drawing some distinction and it's not reflected in any of our rules. So, hey, you better give us regulatory approval or we're going to bring an administrative action saying you're relying on an unpromulgated rule. Um, you know, and another thing I'll follow up on is this idea of uncertainty. Um, obviously, as the regulated entity, uncertainty is probably your biggest risk. Um, you might have, you, you might be subjected to a really draconian regulatory scheme, but if you know what it is, at least you can organize your business model accordingly. Um, but if you don't know how a law might be interpreted or how it might be enforced, or maybe you've brought a new product to market and only realized after the fact that now you're in trouble with the state regulators, um, there's, there's a lot of risk there, but it's agencies have uncertainty too. I don't, agencies are reluctant to admit it, I think when a new technology comes out or some new business model, but agencies aren't even always involved in the legislative process, right? You may have to administer a statute that was drafted without your input and you're trying to figure out what to do with it. You don't want to announce publicly, hey, we don't have jurisdiction over this so you can do whatever you want. So I think reflexively an agency is going to try to exercise its authority, but at the same time, you can be sure when something new comes out like crypto or any other kind of technology, there's a lot of internal conversations going on within the agency and that creates inertia. I mean, mean the regulated party sitting there for maybe a month or six months or two years waiting for regulatory approval and investors are waiting for it and maybe a, a deal can't close until you get it, but the agency sitting there not, not necessarily panicking, but trying to figure out, can we regulate this? And if so, how do we regulate it? So I, I think there's this assumption that any agency that has authority always knows what to do, but that's actually not the case. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have about five minutes left. Do any members of the audience have questions for our panelist? Hi there, William Morris, thanks so much for being here. Um, the question regarding Section 230 litigation, it seems like big tech companies are trying to have their cake and eat it too, uh, in terms of not being held responsible as publishers, and yet also being able to censor people who use their platforms. Uh, that seems unsustainable, but it raises the, the broader policy question of which way should we go? Would it be better to have publishers uh, who are responsible for the content on their sites and then can censor those sites? Or would it be better to not count them as publishers and then to not let them censor? I'd be interested to hear the panel's responses. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll take that one. I think that was for you. Um, so, so first of all, what you've described of a, an internet where websites are not treated as publishers for 
for instance, for purposes of tort defamation liability, and at the same time, they're given the flexibility to not publish speech, not disseminate speech, take speech down. That is exactly the statute that Congress passed. And there are obviously big policy debates occurring right now over Section 230, and even many of the technology companies have, have weighed in on that, saying that, yeah, maybe there needs to be some reform of 230. I'll tell you, at least our position is, as a constitutional matter, the government can't tell private entities, particularly websites, what speech they must publish or disseminate. Uh, the 11th Circuit and many district courts have adopted that position. The 5th Circuit recently created a circuit split with the 11th Circuit disagreeing with that position. So you know, that is under active litigation. But no matter how you come out on that end, it, it's very clear that the, the liability rule for the speech that websites do in fact publish you know, the, the, the liability provision of 230 is doing the work there. And so I, I think if you were to think about the policy debates of where all of that's headed, I mean, obviously, the uh, litigation over the constitutional issues uh, in our net choice cases will uh, continue. But I, I think that's where the, pol the policy debate on 230 is going to be probably more over the C1 and the liability rule there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Does so anyone else in the audience have a question for our panelists? We have time for maybe one or two more. I guess this is a question for the litigators, um, or those have thought of litigation. It, it, it struck me that it, w with tech disruption, you're basically changing the circumstances, and they have a mismatch with older statutes that contemplated different circumstances. And I wonder if you're starting to see cases where they're preserving the question of that the Supreme Court has long held that changed circumstances itself can justify the constitutional invalid, invalidity of a law. Caroline Products itself uh, rec reflects this, and that law um, eventually, the one at issue in Caroline Products, was struck down in the 1970s very much on a changed circumstances theory in the Northern District of Illinois. So I wonder if some of these um, things that are floating around in the case law can be very beneficial now, and if you're actively trying to preserve these issues to get it up, um, I realize it's very deferential on the standard, um, but there's a long doctrinal line. Just to, to the litigators. Well, I mean, I, there's, there's probably going to be some flexibility when you're, when you're dealing with, call it Administrative Procedure Act challenges uh, or in challenging agency actions, and some flexibility to, to make those types of arguments about changed uh, circumstances and the, and the agency's not keeping up with the times and they're not giving reasoned explanations and, and you know, why do we have this type of scheme? So I don't know, off the top of my head, I, I think you know, there, it, it would probably be easier to bring those types of arguments to like agency rules. I think it's gonna be harder with statutes, uh, but uh, you know, there's, I mean, this, this also comes back to the, you, know, you talk about challenging statutes versus challenging regulations. Uh, you know, as, as a litigator, you of course, uh, you, you have many more options to be challenging administrative actions just because of how the doctrines are and that, uh, you know, you talked about before, you know, an agency sometimes doesn't know its own authority and then, you know, a litigator comes in and says, yeah, you don't know your own authority and here are all the problems with it. But I do think that type of argument could come up when you're talking about particularly challenging agency action. All right. We have time for about one more question, if we can keep it short. Any with last questions? Uh, we were talking a little bit about regulatory sandboxes earlier. I wonder if uh, Richard or Chris or, well, any of you guys, but particularly um, have any thoughts on spaces in Texas where there's a need for that or a uh, room uh, where it could really be beneficial here uh, in our great state? Education, yes. Um, Texas is pretty good at a lot of things, um, but it is harder to do the innovation reform that we want on the education side. Um, I think that could be a huge benefit to the state, obviously with the way our school system is structured that is very politically hard. So it's not surprising. Um, that would be kind of the one issue that jumps out to me immediately. Um, Texas is pretty good without the sandboxes for most things, right? Um, you know, going to crypto, for instance, I don't think Texas has done like a particularly good job. 
promoting itself as we have to be the crypto center, but Austin's a huge crypto center. There's a crypto conference going on across the street. Um, that's just because we keep the field relatively open. And there are actually other institutional infrastructure reasons why crypto will win in this state, for instance, like ERCOT has been incredibly supportive of potentially throwing crypto mining operations in West Texas where we have the solar wind corridors connect, things like that. So, you know, I do think most industries here are kind of heading in the right path. But I would say for sure education, um, if I had to kind of point out anything else, I would say probably gig economy marketplaces. My suspicion is that the state, the executive has very high interests in maintaining flexibility on that standard, but that doesn't always go down to the regulatory authority, right? And so again, it's like, how do you have that conversation preemptively so you don't end up getting a tip off and then going through an investigation and then having to go and kind of solve the mess? The mess should hopefully not occur. Um, and so, you know, I think we're still working on that a little bit within the state level. Thank you. Chris, David, anything you want to add on Texas? Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. This has been a wonderful discussion.